Hi everybody. So we're now in week five, I think, of containment. And when I was typing up my notes, the autocorrect got in the way and instead of containment, it said contentment. I don't know whether you feel like you're in week five of contentment or not, but I hope that you found some peace, um, certainly through the service today. Last week, we started a new series looking at neighbouring. We've been basing our thoughts on this book by Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon called The Art of Neighbouring. And we're looking at it on Sundays and also in our life groups. And today I've got a couple of really good stories to share with you. And, you know, it's a great time for us to be thinking about neighbouring. For many of us, our neighbours are the only people kind of outside immediate family who we're seeing face to face every day or regularly when we get out on our daily exercise. And I don't know about you, but I've become really appreciative of the local community, especially when we're looking at black market resources like eggs and flour, having people locally who know where you can get the things that you need. The Bible has got loads of wisdom and instructions on how to live well. And when Jesus was asked to sum them up, he said that the two main important things to do with this. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. And number two, love your neighbour as you love yourself. And if you were with us last week, you'll have heard Paul talking about the story that Jesus used to illustrate that, the story of the Good Samaritan. And if you missed it, you can catch up with it on the podcast on the website. This series is looking at how we take those different commandments um, seriously. And so today I want to look at that. I want to look at how we love God well in lockdown and also how we love our neighbours well in this season. So first of all, loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Well, a really good question you might want to ask is why does God command us to do that? Is he just some kind of egomaniac demanding our devotion or needing our devotion? Not at all. The Bible makes it really clear that God loves us first, that God made us to have relationship with him. He wants us to be friends with him. But unfortunately, stuff gets in the way. We don't always put him first and living his way is the best way. (laughs) He invented it and he made us and he knows how we tick well. But when we put ourselves in front of him, when we do the stuff that the Bible calls sin, then it puts a barrier up between him and us. God saw that, he was really sad. And so he sent Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again from the dead. And that's what we celebrated at Easter the other week. And in doing that, he made a way for sin to be dealt with and for us to be able to connect with God and have friendship with God again. And all that we need to do is to say sorry for the stuff that we've done wrong, to receive his free gift of forgiveness and to commit to living his way. And then he gives us all the help and the resources that we need. You know, I don't know if you've managed to listen to any of Paul's um, Facebook messages, his little devotions that he does Monday to Friday, um, about eight o'clock in the morning. There's some really helpful ones. And on Friday, he actually summed it up really well. He was talking about how many of us feel out of our depth at this time. It's very easy with all the epidemic, the pandemic, the whole change to life to feel that we're floundering, to feel that we're out of our depth. It's almost like being in a swimming pool, he said, and where you start off at the shallow end and then as you move towards the deeper, deep end, sometimes the, the floor just seems to go beneath your feet and all of a sudden there you are trying to tread water and gasping for breath. And in that moment, in that moment of panic and feeling like we don't know where to put our feet, God is the one who comes. God is the one who's there and he's with us. The command to love our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength isn't for his benefit, it's for ours. Because when we put him first, when we choose to live his way, then he promises to be with us all the time and he gives us access to all the resources that we need of peace and joy and love and hope and help. The invitations are open to all of us. And it might be today that you're going, well, it seems like a bit of a cheek. I've never been interested in God before. Why why would I think it was okay to take up this offer now? But Bear Grylls said something really interesting. He said, you know, we all pray at some time or another and there's no such thing as an atheist in the death zone of Everest. And he went on to say this, what is faith? Is it real and does it matter? Can it make a difference to the everyday grind of life? I can only talk from experience. For me, having a Christian faith can be difficult to articulate. It's like describing ice cream or swimming. It has to be tried to be felt. But in a nutshell, my faith tells me that I am known, that I am secure and that I'm loved regardless of the storms I might find myself in from time to time, regardless of how often I fall and fail. In my life, I'm yet to meet a man or woman not open to being loved and forgiven. 
Who doesn't want to find peace or live with joy overflowing? And so the first command to love God with all that we are really means to put him first. And it's a choice that we're invited to make, not just a one off decision, but an everyday choice, because every day things can distract us from that and things can get in the way. And today, as we're thinking about loving God, I'm going to look at a story from the Bible. If you've got kids around, you might want to kind of gather them around the screen because I'm going to be reading this, the, the story. It's the story of Mary and Martha. It's from Luke chapter 10. But Andy has put together um, some Lego images just for us to see things more visually. And I just um, challenge you to look out and see the, the slightly unusual pet um, who Mary and Martha have in their house. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later she stepped in, interrupting them. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. So did you spot the parrot? I love that. A little bit of um, artistic license there from Andy. But also, I love seeing the expressions on the characters' faces, on the Lego characters. Martha just didn't look very happy with Jesus, did she? And, you know, I have a certain degree of sympathy for her. When it's not lockdown, we love having people over. We love um, having a crowd around. But I know that in hosting people, it is hard work. And here Jesus has turned up at Mary and Martha's house and he's brought his friends with him. So he's got, he's got 12 disciples and who knows how many other hangers on. And it is hard work hosting a crowd of people. One version says that um, Martha is actually preparing a big dinner. And so that would be a lot to do. And the problem is that Mary, Martha's sister, just isn't helping. Martha's left to do the work on her own. Mary is sitting there at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. Not only is that completely unhelpful, it actually goes against the cultural norms of the day. Mary should have been in the kitchen. She shouldn't have been there with the men and listening to Jesus. And this all gets far too much for dear Martha. Maybe she starts off kind of clanging her pots and pans a bit just to get some attention from Jesus. Maybe she actually pops through and says something along the lines of, look, it's all right for you, Lord, but we haven't all got access to a few loaves and some fish and the ability to make a banquet for lots and lots of people. I need some help here, please. But Jesus says something surprising, something she wasn't expecting. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential and Mary has chosen it. And the New International Version of the Bible words it like this. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And in this story, there's a marked contrast, isn't there, between the two women and the choices that they've made. And Jesus seems to suggest that even though Martha is very busy, she also has the option to make a choice. So loving God, I think, this story says, means actually coming to be with him. Martha's been great, isn't she? She's serving Jesus. She's doing things for him. But actually the better choice is coming to be with him. So what does that mean for us during lockdown? Well, we're all experiencing this crisis very differently, aren't we? For some people, being locked down in lockdown is just a well-needed chance to take a pause from normal life and have a rest. And you're really just enjoying the time to reflect and to think and to um, catch up with jobs around the house. But for others, lockdown is a huge challenge. 
Maybe you're dealing with isolation or perhaps you've got very complicated relationships at home that you're trying to navigate. Maybe you've got a lack of money. You've got a very uncertain future. You're worried about what's going to happen to your home or your job. Even though the way we work it out may be different, God's invitation to love him, to put him first and to love our neighbours is the same for all of us. Now, one of the key things for me in this time is about avoiding comparison. You know, in five weeks of lockdown, I haven't remodelled our garden. I haven't painted any rooms. I haven't learnt to crochet and I haven't even managed a week's worth of Joe Wick's workouts. Maybe you have. And it's very easy for me to think about the shoulds, to look on Instagram or Facebook and see what everybody else is doing. But I think the encouragement here is that we're not supposed to look at anybody else. We need to work out what is the right thing for us. And whether we're busy or quiet in this season, Jesus's invitation, maybe even his instruction is the same, to be with him. So what does that look like for you? Well, maybe in this season you feel like Martha, you're very busy. You've got children at home all the time. Perhaps you're a key worker going out to work. Maybe you've got huge responsibility at work for lots of people. Perhaps you're caring for sick relatives. Maybe you feel stretched on every front. Perhaps you are not with a lot of people, but you're feeling very isolated and very alone. And in this season, in one of the storms of life, even in that place, I want to encourage you that we have a choice to be with Jesus. He promises that he's always with us, even in the storm, that he never leaves us. And I was reading this passage in Mark. It's in Mark chapter six, and it's starting at verse 47. You can read along if you'd like to, or just listen to me. Late in the night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking that he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed. And I don't know what the storm looks like for you in lockdown. Perhaps you're just feeling that your emotions are really frazzled. Perhaps you're exhausted. You just haven't had proper rest or sleep for a while. Maybe you're full of fear. As we said before, perhaps you've got responsibilities that just feel beyond what you can carry. Whatever your circumstances, whatever the storm, Jesus's words are the same. He says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. And one thing I just found really interesting reading this passage is that Jesus's disciples were in the boat. They're people who've been with him. They've been listening to him. They journeyed with him. And yet they didn't recognise him when he came to them in the storm. And I wonder if some of us are not recognising Jesus in the storm. His promise is the same, take courage, I'm here. Are we actually seeing that? For me, I've realised that the things that I need to do in lockdown in order to connect with and to see Jesus, to put him first, are different to those things that I was doing before lockdown. My life was very different before lockdown. I went out to work. I had time, I had a lovely walk by the river I used to take sometimes to pray. I had silence and solitude at home at different times when I wanted it because often I was was the only one able to be at home. There are all kinds of things that happened then that don't happen now. And maybe it's the same for you. My daily routine has changed and I need to find the ways that I can connect with Jesus now. And perhaps for you, you are a mum who used to have a very busy morning And then you take the kids to school and nursery and you could come home and have a coffee and read your Bible and pray. And you haven't got that opportunity for connection now. Or maybe you're someone on the journey home from work back to home. You could have time to think and reflect and pray or put on a worship CD in the car. That was a time when you connected with God. Or maybe you're someone who doesn't usually feel a lot of emotion. But at the moment, your emotions seem to be taking over and you just don't know how to express those. I just want to encourage you to think about the different ways that you can recognise and see Jesus in the storm with you. Maybe the extended times you had aren't there anymore, but you can 
Get a verse from the Bible that means a lot to you. Maybe that is going to be the one. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. And put it up on the fridge or put it by the kettle. Maybe before you go to bed, rather than checking Instagram or watching something on Netflix, just be helpful to spend a few minutes being grateful for what's happened in the day and giving things to Jesus. Thinking about the different things that we can do to help us see him in the storm and in this season. Maybe you're someone who, for now, journaling could be a really good way to express your emotions, to be real with him about who you are and where you're at. Perhaps in your isolation, you are looking for things to do. You're wondering how you can meet Jesus in a new way in this season. And perhaps you've got time and capacity to do some more study, to look into the Bible some more. Vineyardtraining.org has some great resources, many of which are free that you might like to look at. Um, to just dig deeper into the Bible. Or perhaps you just want to commit to pray for some of the young families in church or for people in your neighbourhood. Different ways to help you connect with Jesus in this time. So the first command is about loving God. And you know, as we love him, he gives us the resources that we need to keep going even in the storm. And the second command is about loving our neighbour. And I think for some of us, the temptation is to try and put that one first. But actually, we don't really have anything to offer our neighbours until we've connected with God and we know the peace and the security and the safety and the love that comes from being with him. You know, this is a new season of opportunity, isn't it, to love our neighbours? We were out clapping for the NHS the other day and I met someone who lives on our road who I've never, ever seen before. And it was really great to go and find out his name and find out a little bit about him. He just, he lives a different life to us, comes and goes at different times, but this was our opportunity to say hi to him. And as followers of Jesus, we're not the only people trying to be good neighbours, are we? In our street, we've got people making soup for those who are um, having to stay at home. We've got someone collecting prescriptions. We've got another lady who lent us an archery set so that we could have some fun in the garden. People are good neighbours. But it's been just such a joy for Nigel and I to see um, how the church community are often at the forefront of being good neighbours. Jim and Natasha told us about a self-distancing quiz and disco that they hosted for the people on their street. Everybody came and sat in their front gardens with a cup of tea or maybe something else. And Jim and Natasha broadcast some quiz questions and then put on some music so the kids could have a dance. Just a lovely moment in order to be able to break some of the boredom. And more seriously, Tom and Tess shared this week that they've been um, really concerned about some of their neighbours who are running low on lockdown essentials and they felt that they really had to act. So they went to the shop and they bought some essentials. Here's a picture of what they bought. They delivered them to their neighbours with a little note saying, we think you're running short on necessities in this season. And would you be interested in joining a community WhatsApp locally? Is there anything that you need? Can we help you out? And I thought, wasn't that just a lovely way to um, boost community spirit, to connect with people? by giving some chocolate, just a a gift, a a little bit of fun. So in this season, there's a great opportunity for us to try and obey Jesus' command to love our neighbours. And you may well have seen last week, perhaps we've had a go at it, but Paul encouraged us to produce one of these block maps. Um, Depending on the layout of your street, put where your house is and then the neighbours who live closest around you. Maybe your street is a different shape, but you get the idea. And each of the squares represents a house on the street and the suggestion is that you try and fill in as many of the squares as you can so who are the people who live in each house do you know their names do you know something about them maybe a job interest that they've got maybe a country that they used to live in and then do you know anything about their hopes and their dreams that's kind of getting to know them in in rather more detail because Jesus said to love our neighbours but how can we love our neighbours if we don't even know them So if you haven't tried it yet, why don't you fill in the block map? If you did start it already, then why don't you see if there's some more that you can add to it in the week? And I know that some of you are literally stuck at home. You're not seeing your neighbours in this time. And I understand that that's really, really frustrating. I've heard people say, I just want to be out in the community. I want to be out helping people. And my suggestion to you is that you haven't already, then why don't you complete one of those maps anyway? If you don't know people's names, then why don't you just commit to praying for each house in your street or in your block for the next few weeks and ask God that you'd have opportunities to get to know these people after lockdown's over. Now, I've also already talked about how lots of people are being good neighbours at the moment, and that's a wonderful thing. 
And it just led me to thinking, so what does it mean for us to love our neighbours? What is there that we can offer and that we can bring to community that's different? And the obvious answer in that is Jesus. Because as we think about and as we pray for our neighbours, we do that with the confidence that he knows them well. And I was just wondering whether we might like to take up the challenge of praying for the neighbours who live around us and seeing if there's anything that the Lord would like to say to them or anything that he'd want to encourage them with. Perhaps this week we might take up the challenge to listen to him for them and see if there's a word of encouragement, something that would um, spur them on. And maybe he'll give us an opportunity to share that. And if you are living on your own and you can't get out to see people, then potentially you could always send them a note. You know where your neighbours live and perhaps you need to ask someone to post it for you. But a note just saying, look, I'm thinking about you. I'm cheering you on in this season. Do you want to have some kind of connection? I can't come and see you, but I'd happily chat on the phone. I think for me, sometimes I feel like I have to do everything. And Jesus doesn't say, be the answer to all your neighbours' problems. Instead, he just says, love your neighbours. And so we can ask him how he wants us to do that.